Hi, everyone. This is Michael Lee, founder of the Data Incubator. We're a data science training and AI company. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, we uh, are probably best known for our data science fellowship, which helps PhDs and master's students looking to enter uh, the industry as data scientists. Uh, it's completely free for the fellows who get in, and you can apply online at the dataincubator.com. We also offer a number of uh, courses uh, for corporate training, as well as online courses that you can take uh, at nighttime after work. And if, to learn more, you can also sign up at the dataincubator.com. But today, we're going to be speaking with my friend Sean here. Wave hi, Sean. Hi. Uh, so and we'll be doing another installment of our Data Science in 30 Minutes talk. This is a regular monthly series about data and its role in the world. Our past speakers have included Kirk Bourne, Director of Data Science at Booz Allen Hamilton, Becky Tucker, a data scientist at Netflix, Holden Corral, an engineering lead at IBM and a contributor to Apache Spark, Zubin Garmani, uh, Chief Scientist at Uber, Sam Swift, VP of Data Science at Betterment, and a former TDI fellow. Uh, and you can find those and other DS30 uh, online on our website at thedataincubator.com. Now, before I introduce today's speaker, I want to remind everyone that you can post questions in the YouTube chat area, and we'll be monitoring those, uh, and then we'll pose them to the speaker at the end of his talk. Uh, and in order to pose questions, I think you actually have to be logged in using your Google account. So if you're not already and you'd like to pose questions, please log in. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's speaker. So this is Sean Garish, a good friend of mine back from our grad school days. Uh, he's a data scientist and ML engineer who's led machine learning and data science teams at both Google and Tezza, and he's currently at Google. Uh, he holds a PhD uh, in machine learning from Princeton University, and he's also author of the new book, How Smart Machines Think, from MIT Press. Uh, Sean, why don't you take it away? Thank you for the introduction, uh, Michael. I'm just going to quickly load up my um, uh, presentation I have. And um, can you confirm, um, Michael, that you can we see this see screen? We see your presentation. Okay, great. So um, as Michael mentioned, I um, have uh, recently written a book called How Smart Machines Think. And um, this, this book was something that I, um, that I wrote because I, I noticed that there are a number of different breakthroughs that come out on a, a regular basis. Um, and they've come out, say, over the last two decades where we realize that suddenly computers can do something that they couldn't do before using AI or machine learning. And even though I'd spent a, a while learning about machine learning and AI from classes and from applying it at companies like Google, I, I realized that these breakthroughs weren't things that I could easily explain. Like I, I would think that, okay, I, I was studying machine learning in, in grad school, I should be able to understand how these things work, but it turns out that most typical courses don't prepare you to understand these things. And so I, I wrote this book after spending some time researching these breakthroughs in order to explain how some of the core ideas from fields like AI and machine learning can um, be combined together to, to create these breakthroughs. Again, things that are not typically taught in a, a, a traditional machine learning or AI course. Um, it's worth noting that uh, the what I'm gonna be talking about today is, um, is actually not related to what I do at Google. Uh, this is something that I'm um, interested in on my own as well. Um, and so what I'm gonna talk about today is, um, is not necessarily the, um, the view of Google. It's, it's something that um, reflects my own personal opinions and my own personal views and my own personal research. So realistically, we don't have time to talk about IBM's Jeopardy playing Watson um, and AlphaGo, the, the Go playing computer created by DeepMind um, and artificial neural networks and movie recommendation engines. Um, so we're just gonna focus on self-driving cars. And it's, it's such a big field that we won't be able to do a whole lot. So I'm gonna focus mostly on um, several years, uh, about a, a little over a decade ago, during which we were able to um, we as in the, the community, the research field, was able to create self-driving cars that could do some pretty amazing things. And so we're, we're going to uh, begin by looking at a, a race that was organized by DARPA, the Defense Research Ad 
um, excuse me, at Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, um, a branch of the military, um, to, to basically figure out how we as a society can build uh, robot cars. And so DARPA organized this competition in an artificial uh, controlled urban environment. It was an unrehearsed robot race. And what that means is that essentially DARPA took one of its old military bases and asked the researchers who were creating these cars to have their cars drive around with other robot cars and with human drivers um, on this military base and follow California traffic laws. And they had to do things like drive from one part of the urban environment to another part, parking a parking spot, stop at intersections, wait for um, their chance to go, and um, avoid hitting other cars in the process. And this is something that um, uh, a number of cars did pretty well with, and um, they, they had to do this for four hours, and the winner would receive a $2 million prize. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you how, they, how this one of these cars actually worked. Um, but before doing that, it's what I'd like to do is um, describe to you the, some of the earlier competitions because that'll allow us to kind of build up incrementally to how these cars actually worked. So let's start out um, by going back a few years before that 2007 race to 2004, which was the first of three robot races organized by, by this DARPA organization. And what they did is they asked uh, cars to, they asked research teams to create cars that could drive for about 150 miles in a desert from one location to another. And the winner would receive a million dollar prize. And this was unrehearsed. And what unrehearsed means is that the, the research scientists creating the cars ahead of time didn't know what um, route their cars would actually have to take. They knew roughly where it would start, but they didn't actually know where it would end up. And so they, um, they were given that just two hours ahead of the race and they had to um, make their cars, excuse me, robust to the, um, the different types of routes they might end up taking. And uh, this, this path went from Barstow, California to Prim, Nevada. This is not necessarily the route that they took, but they took a similar route to it. Um, and um, as you can tell, it's actually a pretty long distance, right? Like this is a non-trivial, um, piece of the United States map um, and the cars had to drive all that distance within um, a basically a morning. And um, so your question, the question that should be in your mind and that I, I um, try to explain in my book is how, how did these cars work? Like how did they drive from one location to another? And the, the simple answer, and I'm going to get into more detail here, but the simple answer I want you to remember for, for right now is that these cars that drove from one location in the desert to another um, focused primarily on, on two pieces of technology. Um, one of them was navigation and in particular sensors like GPS. Another was, um, was uh, mapping and essentially collecting as much information as possible about the, the whole region, um, not just the path that they took, but the whole region because they didn't know which path they were going to take so that they could understand the, which areas might be difficult or easy to drive over. Now the best performing car in this race in 2004 was a, a car built by um, some researchers at Carnegie Mellon University and a team known as the Red Team. And this car, uh, it turns out that it drove only 7% of the road, excuse me, 5% of the road. It drove seven miles, which was about 5% of the road before it went off the road, um, got stuck behind a, a, a big rock, spun its wheels for seven minutes, and then um, had its wheels catch on fire. So this, this is the best performing car out of over uh, 100 teams who submitted entries ahead of the race. And, and they still didn't do it. And so um, it turns out that what these cars, even though these cars had re reasonably good GPS and accelerometers and all these other sensors, and even though they had really good maps of the world, they didn't have necessarily very good sensor. They, excuse me, they didn't have very good algorithms for taking their sensor readings and um, synthesizing it and turning it into a form that was useful for the cars. But what they did use, in addition to the um, GPS sensors and mapping that you should remember, is that they used something called a search algorithm. And if, you, if you've taken a class in AI, then there's a good chance, especially if you use the Russell Norvig book, um, which is the kind of the Bible of AI courses, then you'll remember that the first thing that they teach you about is, is search algorithms. Um, these are basically just imagine when you um, go to Google, uh, to find directions from 
say your home to the local Home Depot, it'll give you a reasonably fast route um, from where you are now to that Home Depot. That's essentially the, the key idea that these cars used, except that they used their own custom maps with their own estimates of how long it would take to drive over different cells in, in the map. Um, but again, this car, even the, the best performing car, even though it was a Humvee, um, didn't do very well. So DARPA decided the, the following year, a little over a year later, that they would uh, organize a second competition. Uh, this time it was 132 miles um, with a $2 million prize. So they doubled the prize from the previous year to the fastest team to complete the route. And um, the this year, even though in the previous race only uh, zero teams uh, completed and the best one only did 5% of the route, in this case, um, just over a year later, uh, five vehicles crossed the finish line. And the the winner of, of the race that year was a car built by uh, Stanford University researchers, by, uh, led by someone named Sebastian Thrun. And uh, this car was so fast that even though the cars were released one at a time in five minute in increments, they this car um, caught up to the car in front of it. So they paused the, the car and then um, waited a while and then this car caught up again to the car in front of it. So they decided, okay, let's just pause the other car so this car could, could go ahead of it. And in the end, this car went, um, completed the race over 10 minutes faster than its next closest competitor. And um, the, the questions you should have in your mind again are, what was it about this particular car that made it so good. And there were a couple of things. One of them was that they they didn't say, they decided not to rely so much on having a heavy duty car like a Humvee. They decided instead to focus and to lean more on software as, as the solution to the problem. So instead of saying, we're gonna have just a big heavy car that can drive over any fence post that gets in its way, we're going to instead have um, focus on software and good software principles and good testing in order to solve the problem. So brains over brawn. Sorry, what's that? Brains over brawn. Exactly, brains over brawn. That's a good analogy, yep. Um, the, uh, the second um, the thing that they did was they focused on machine learning. And just to, to quote uh, a line from one of their papers after the, um, after the race, they said the pervasive use of machine learning both ahead of and during the race made Stanley robust and precise. We believe these techniques, along with the extensive testing that took place, contributed significantly to Stanley's success in the race. And this was, um, it, it might seem kind of obvious to use machine learning now in self-driving cars, but if you looked at the previous race where the, um, they didn't, nobody completed the race, um, the winner or the best performing car in that race didn't mention machine learning at all in their paper. Um, this doesn't mean that they didn't use machine learning, that they, machine learning wasn't something that they were really thinking about as the, the core solution to them. The solution revolved around mapping and building a really high quality map. So how do they use machine learning? Um, I'm gonna describe several different um, modules that they use where each of the modules were things that you might expect to see in a traditional machine learning class. Uh, as a, say an assignment. Um, so one of these modules was simply a t drivable terrain classifier. So uh, this car built by the Stanford researchers had LIDAR or basically laser scanners attached to it. Uh, and these laser scanners could detect whether there was, um, what height their um, the different ground was at different distances and directions from the car. And so they, they built a model to predict drivable terrain. Um, but they found that it had too many parameters to tune and it wasn't very accurate and the car would basically drive off the road whenever they would try to put it on the road because it would hallucinate obstacles in front of it. And at, this, that, at that point they weren't using machine learning but they figured out, okay, well what we can do is we can actually have a human drive this car around and um, while well, the sensors are collecting data in order to, to create training data to train a model with the idea that a human isn't going to drive over terrain that's not drivable by definition, whereas it will drive over terrain that is drivable by definition. And so the, uh, based on, after they collected a bunch of this data, they fed it into their model. And um, the, the key word here that you should think of if you're familiar with machine learning is that they basically just built a classifier to classify whether that terrain around it was drivable or not. And so here on the, um, the right-hand side, you can see the um, blue um, pixels, the blue cells in the, the grid are drivable terrain, whereas the 
red cells in the grid are not drivable terrain based on their classifier. And so that told them whether the terrain was drivable or not. It doesn't say anything really about whether there's the car is actually on a road. So technically, the car could go off the road at this point. This race didn't require them to follow California traffic laws. It just required them to like um, not crash into a rock, for example. Um, but at the same time, um, they they couldn't necessarily go very fast if they were off-road. They could only go about 25 miles an hour instead of 45 miles an hour, which is a speed they could get up to if they were on the road. So a second thing that they did was they built, they used a different machine learning algorithm to predict whether the road um, went out far in front of the in front of the car. And so here they use something known as a clustering algorithm, which again is is a very common class of algorithms in machine learning. The basic idea is that they um, they use the color camera because the color camera could see further than these these light scanner these laser scanners, and they said, okay, well let's just assume that the pixels in a trapezoid in front of the car are part of the road, and let's assume that some pixels outside of that trapezoid are not part of the road, and let's remove the skyline because we're using some traditional computer vision heuristics, and then based on the um, the pixels in the trapezoid and the pixels out of the trapezoid, build this clustering algorithm and figure out whether the remaining pixels um, throughout the rest of the picture are part of the road or not. Um, and this again is something that if you if you know machine learning, you can um, you know how to kind of crank these sorts of models out. It's a pretty simple problem. And um, and you can actually get a pretty good sense for whether the pixels in the image are part of the um, road or not the road, as you see in this third column. And you can use that to, and then combine that with some geometry to figure out how far does the road go ahead. And if it goes out pretty far ahead of you, then you can um, use that information to speed up to 45 miles an hour instead of going the, the slower 25 miles an hour. And was this learning in real time as it was driving, or was Good. they just that, sort of taking some training that they collected? Good question. So the um, the learning was. The model was running in real time, and the clustering was happening in real time. So essentially, you could say that it was um, it was adjusting in real time. I don't really know that I'd say that it was training because it was it was essentially a clustering algorithm where it was constantly creating new um, clusters from the pixels. So it was it was constantly updating. Okay, and so presumably this would then allow it to handle like uh, different weather conditions. Like, oh, now it's cloudy, my yep. algorithm adjust automatically adjusts because. The entire picture in front of me is now cloudy. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, exactly right. Uh, and and the the question too about um, whether these things were running in real time is something that um, gets at one of the core questions of how this um, how these pieces fit together, which I'll talk about in just a second. But yeah, you're absolutely right that it was adjusting in real time, so that if, for example, the color of the road changed, they could also adjust to that. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, third component uh, module that they used um, where they used machine learning was a tool to identify the edges of the road. So this again took the inputs from some laser scanners that they had along the, the sides of the car and uh, they used something called a Kalman filter which is um, again a, a pretty simple and well understood uh, model and they, they essentially said okay well um, let's figure out where the um, road stops being um, smooth and where there start to be what looks like obstacles along it. And um, let's figure out from that whether we think that there's a discontinuity and whether the edge of the road is, is there or not. And so this classifier essentially figured out where the car was um, relative to the two edges of the road and where the center of the road was. Again, this is something that if you if you are familiar with machine learning, it's um, a pretty straightforward task. Um, you, can, you can get better by just kind of turning the crank and continuing to improve that particular model. Um, it's worth noting that this model, this part of the, this module was used a little bit more for steering, whereas the previous module was used, um, the road uh, detection module was used more for speeding up and slowing down. And so um, one question you might have in your mind that I think kind of gets at the, the key idea behind how these, these um, cars work is like, how did these modules fit together? What, what was the, the architecture of them. And you can think about the architecture, like uh, architecture is a really key part of a lot of these intelligent systems. It really um, explains how these components fit together. Um, and if you don't understand the architecture, I don't think that, it, I think it's hard to reason about them. Um, so I'm gonna try to describe it in terms of the architecture. 
So there were three different layers of the architecture. Um, the, there was the hardware layer, which had the sensors, which basically took in measurements and fed a whole bunch of clouds of points to the uh, another part of the system. And the actuators, basically the, the steering and the, the motor um, that affected the movement of the car. So there, and if you are going to, um, like these are parts of the car that will not change. Like, I mean, you can, you can improve the sensors and you can improve the actuators, but these are less focused on the software. Um, a different layer focused on perception and world, model, world modeling. And this is where those machine learning modules that I was talking about, the three ones to detect the edges of the road or how far the road went out in front of the car or um, whether terrain was drivable, that's where these modules lived. And what these did is they basically took the, the cloud of measurements from the sensors of the car and turned them into something that was actually meaningful. So a different part of the, of the um, self-driving car could actually do its work. And then the planning layer, which I haven't talked about yet, was, some, was what actually did the, what you might think of as the more intelligent parts of, um, of driving. So even though machine learning is something that's often, I think, conflated with intelligence, the algorithms that I described to you were the, the three different machine learning algorithms that I described to you were actually pretty simple and they're pretty easy to, to, to trick. They're pretty easy to, um, to build and they're, um, they're, I mean, not to repeat myself, but they're just pretty simple and um, they're not really doing anything intelligent. The, the planning component though does what you think of as intelligence. And what this does is things like um, search for paths. And so, the intuition you should have here is um, that when this car was originally um, started, or excuse me, when the race started, the um, the race organizers gave the cars a um, the start and end points. This car ran for about 20 seconds, an algorithm to figure out the best path from its current location to the end location. And it figured out basically a corridor. You can imagine almost like a tube from the beginning of the race to the end of the race. And then um, the, the planning part of the car, um, all that really did is it just said, okay, well, how fast should I go within this corridor? And should I veer left or right within this corridor? And so the, the analogy that, um, that, you might, that might come to mind for some of you is there, there was a game called Red Racer back in, um, released around 1987. It was a, I don't know if it was Nintendo originally or arcade, but in any case, it was a, a game that came out on Nintendo where your only two controls are speed up and slow down or um, veer to the left or veer to the right. And that's essentially what this car was doing. That's essentially how this car um, drove in the race. And so the, um, it didn't really see cars. I mean, it's worth noting that there weren't other cars in its path except for when it caught up to that car, but there were obstacles in its path. And it, it, was, it was basically programmed to um, search through a whole bunch of different possible trajectories over the next, say, 10 seconds and choose those trajectories that it helped it to avoid um, undrivable terrain and that helped it to get near the center of the road when there was nothing else in its way, for example. Um, so this tells you how you can get a car to drive through the desert from one location to another um, fairly quickly, but it doesn't really tell you how to have a car that can drive in a, an urban environment um, while following California traffic laws. Mm -hmm. um, it's, so I'm gonna try to explain based on what I've said so far, um, a, a little bit more about how a car could actually drive in an urban environment. Um, again, while obeying these traffic laws, while there are still other cars around. And um, keeping in mind what you had in mind before, um, I'd like to quickly show you a video of a one of these cars and so this is um one of the uh cars from the darpa urban challenge what it's doing is it's following it's performing one of its missions and it's driving towards a parking lot and it's um its mission right now is to um park in one of the parking spaces so mm -hmm. you're seeing that it's it's entered the parking lot and what it's going to do is it's going to try to park in this spot right here with the propeller over top of it. So you've noticed that it actually, it would have overturned, um, unfortunately. So what it's doing is it's um, turning around. 
and it's going to it's not going to reverse it's not going to reverse no no it's um it's instead going to um turn around and park in that parking spot in a, a fairly smooth continuous fashion now it could have it could have reversed and that would have been an alternative but the to me what was really spectacular about this was that the car was um able to identify that it it couldn't accomplish its its goal of parking in that parking spot so it actually had to to do something else to to solve that problem to actually still complete its mission um and the previous car that i told you about the the red racer type of car that was driving in the desert without any other obstacles couldn't have couldn't have done that it didn't have any sort of intelligent behavior and except for just to choose the best path um excuse me to choose how to veer left and right and how to speed up and slow down. So the the key idea that set this, um, the winner in this race apart from the winner in a previous race uh, was that it had some additional components in the planning layers. So it still had that hardware layer that focused on sensing, uh, that, that included the sensors and the actuators. It still had the perception and world modeling layers, which or layer which included the perception modules, basically the machine learning modules, and the the world model like the map. But it also had some additional um, planning steps. So one of these um, planning um, components was something that you should think of as um, just again a route planner, something that says wherever I am right now, um, find me the fastest route to where I want to go, and here it was it was a little bit more than just a route planner. It was actually a little bit more of a mission planner. It might need to do things like um, park in a parking spot. Like it might include extra metadata about that. But for now, you should just think of it as something that just plans the best route. And um, if you if you whether you're a Google um, uh, Maps user or you use other similar uh, technology, a lot of it now can basically correct you if you go off track. And that's the sort of thing that this this um, algorithm was doing, and it was running constantly. It was always always searching for the best route. Um, but this sort of route planner couldn't do things like parking in a, in a parking spot. That was the responsibility of something called the motion planner. And what this did is this basically said, okay, get me for, if I want to park my car. Uh, this is my car in this this parking spot. Um, you 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 can use a search algorithm and it did use a search algorithm, but you need to basically do it in such a way that you follow the, the laws of physics, right? So you need to make sure that you, um, if you, that you have a um, continuous velocity, for example, and you need to make sure that your orientation makes sense. And so what it did is it basically said, okay, look at the perception and world modeling layer. Let's figure out what the, our sensors tell us and what our machine learning modules tell us about the world, um, figure out how we can, um, what the obstacles are. And then do a search by searching through a tree of a whole bunch of different possible orientations and velocities and positions and so on. And um, based on that search, find a path from where we are to where we want to go. And so the route planner and the motion planner were both performing searches, but they were performing searches at um, different levels. One of them at the level of, say, parking lots um, with um, on the scale of like 10 seconds or so. Um, the other one on the scale of um, say miles for about two minutes or so. And then intermediating between these two components was something called the monopoly board. Um, this is my own terminology. Um, they used a different phrase. I'm drawing a blank on the, at the moment on the phrase they used to describe it. But the, the key idea here is that this is something known as a, um, known to computer scientists as a state machine. And the, the basic idea is that um, you can think of this as like a rule book for moving your pieces around the Monopoly board. Um, so you you know that you can move the pieces around a Monopoly board based on certain rules, based on heuristics that are um, going to be easy to determine and easy to compute um, using some of the information about what you know about the world from the perception and world modeling layer. Um, the one example of, of um, a state machine that was used for the self-driving car was one related to crossing an intersection. And here you could basically, like Im you imagine that you um, enter this state machine here where you check whether your sensors are okay. If your sensors are okay, you um, you wait for precedence. That is, you wait for other cars to, um, to uh, other cars that you're supposed to wait for to go. And once you think that it's your turn to go, you actually, um, you, you wait for the intersection to clear 
case someone didn't in case someone else didn't follow the rules um, if the intersection is not clear then um, you you need to navigate it in a certain way if it is clear then you basically drive straight through it um, if suddenly there's an obstacle that appears, then you need to basically get into the other lane, for example. And so these are all human encoded rules that were put into the computer, whereas the route planner and the motion planner didn't really have human encoded rules. They, they were more search based. The Monopoly board was one way to get human intelligence into it and also to add a way for the car to um, have contingency plans to basically say, OK, if I can't park in that parking spot because I overturned, what should I do? I should basically figure out a different path. And that's one of the ways in which the car was able to, um, to gracefully handle that overturn in the parking lot. And um, so that's the key. Uh, those are the, some of the key ideas behind so how self-driving cars worked. Um, one other thing that's worth mentioning is that the, the um, best performing car in that race was a car that was built by um, some researchers over at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. And um, they had uh, an additional focus on something that they um, that helped to handle errors. So if there was a problem with the car and um, an exception, basically, with how it was um, approaching the world, then it had different um, levels of, uh, how might you say it? Um, it could basically escalate to different levels. So if something happened, for example, someone jumped in front of the car, then it might actually have um, a um, a way to um, to deal with that. If for some reason the car got stuck, then it would have different levels of um, dealing of, of escalating those problems and dealing with them. So one example of this was that at one point the car, um, their car was um, had parked or had stopped at an intersection, and um, it tried to get ahead of the car in front of it, but it couldn't. Um, and it tried again, but it couldn't. And I think it tried even for a third time, but it couldn't. Um, and it turned out that there was actually no car in front of it. It was just hallucinating that car. And this was due to a bug in its software. But even though it was um, trying to, um, even though I had the bug in its software, it was able to, to deal with this gracefully because as it continued escalating, it was able to, um, to eventually say, okay, let's just assume that the road in front of us is blocked and let's do a U-turn and find a different path. So by having um, error handling built into it and having some way to gracefully um, handle errors, it was able to actually comp complete the race and not get stuck even though some of the other software in it was faulty. Um, so those are some of the key ideas behind how self-driving cars worked. Um, again, these this is self-driving cars as of 2007. Um, they've made a lot of progress since then. Um, but at the same time, the um, a lot of the key ideas um haven't changed a whole lot um and i don't know if the self-driving car experts would say that but the main point i want to express is that there are some certain things that will not change um there's always going to be a hardware layer um depending on how you draw the rest of the diagram there will always be perception world modeling components and modules and there will always be planning components and modules like that perform things like search um so, and oh go ahead you know, one of the things i'm struck by uh, yeah, and especially if we, as we think of sort of further in the future, there's sort of a line, if you will, between um, the yeah. let's call it the kind of AI portions, the stuff that's ML, and mm -hmm. then the uh, expert human systems, right? So, like you could classify the monopoly board perhaps as an expert human system where we we draw mm -hmm. this sort of diagram of kind of Markov chain thing where we determine flow states and exact rules for when you move to one state or another. Yeah. As ML gets better, do you expect more of the features that we have put into the uh, expert system to sort of be handled by more of an ML type system? Um, that's a good question. I I could believe that that's true. I think there will always be some, um, we'll say, expert systems or state machines that are hand created by humans um, just to handle things like like traffic laws. You can never learn by trial and error because <laughs> you'd have to pay like way too much in tickets and like um dead people i think like with all due respect to people like by you know having accidents and stuff like that like insurers would not insure you if you if you had um if you had to learn by trial and error so i think that there will be some things that will always have to have human intervention but i think that your intuition is probably right because i think that in some ways we are able to learn um certain state machines for example by like um 
what's an example? I, I see um, recurrent neural networks as one example of that, where you you basically have um, you learn the the transitions between different um, sounds that human voices make um, by using a ton of data, uh, whereas you you might have plugged that in based on manual rules before. Now now we're able to start learning it from just a ton of data. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an area where I remember as a computer as an undergrad, uh, we programmed these little Markov chains that would. Mm -hmm read in Shakespeare and output Shakespeare-ish like things, mm -hmm. right? But it was pretty simplistic logic. And obviously you can do a lot more now with deep learning that's a lot yep. more accurate than the simplistic Markov chain models that we built. I think you're uh, right. Undergrads. Yep, yep, absolutely. Yep. Um, yeah, and, and so that's really um, the all, all I have to, to talk about today. Um, I'm happy to talk about um, to you know, answer any questions you might have about about self-driving cars, at least as far as um, what I covered in the in the book, um, or in today's presentation. Um, I right now I just show a little bit of information in case you're curious about additional topics in the book. But um, but yeah, if if you have any other questions, happy to address them. Yeah, so we have a number of questions from the audience. Uh -huh. uh, the first one is uh, you were referring to uh, one of the books as the Bible of AI. Uh, yeah. What was the book? Oh, good question. So the book is um, a book by um, uh, Stuart Russell and Peter Norvig. Um, and I think it's just called um, Artificial Intelligence, A Modern Approach. And this is the, the textbook that's used by uh, a ton of different um, universities as their intro to AI um, textbook. And um, I think they're in their at least their third edition right now. But if you, I, I usually suggest just getting like the second edition because you can find it for a lot cheaper on Amazon if you get a used copy. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a, a good book. It covers a broad range of topics, and um, I it does it covers AI though more than machine learning. If I remember correctly, there might be a, a few chap like a one or two chapters on machine learning, but it's still useful for someone who's curious about the topic. And it's most so it's mostly about expert systems or. Oh no! It's it's mostly just about it's it's about a whole bunch of different topics in artificial intelligence. It's about um, like it starts out talking about search algorithms, for example. Wow. It talks some about parsing. It talks some about machine learning. It talks some about um, Bayesian learning. Um, talks some about common filters. Whatever topic you have in mind in AI, um, it there's a good chance that it covers it at least at a high a level appropriate for say like a maybe a second year. Um, computer science student. Oh, okay. Very cool. Very cool. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, another question: Why does uh, why are NLP tasks like machine translation so hard? Uh, as like meaning, like why does it take so many CPU or GPU cycles to get a reasonable machine learning translation algorithm out? Um, that's a good question. I. So I, I I don't know if I'm actually the best person to answer this question because I'm um, not a I, I don't work on um, machine translation. I my familiarity with it is probably from about 2004 or so, um, like what we knew about it in 2004. Um, but I think one of the challenges, I mean, at, at the time then, one of the challenges was we just had a ton of a ton of data to um, to train algorithms, um, and we also didn't know at the time the best models to use. So when I say we didn't have a ton of data, remember that if your goal is to um, train a model to translate from one language to another, you um, it helps to have what's called a par parallel corpus, where you have some text in one language and then um, the same text translated to a different language. Um, so at least at that time, I remember that there were some parallel corpora, but, um, a, but we didn't have a ton of it. Um, an additional problem is just that different languages represent things very differently. And I don't know if this is a very satisfying answer, um, but my understanding is that we, we're still experimenting with the um, the sorts of models that will best help us to represent um, languages in essentially a, a language um, independent way. So if you can imagine like one way you might think about it um, is that there's like some sort of universal representation for an, an idea, and all you need to do is go from one language to that universal representation, then go, then go to a different language. Um, 
And I don't know the best answer for why we can't do that yet, ex just except that NLP tasks overall are, are really difficult. And they, uh, yeah, I mean, it, 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 like I think that we, we still have a lot of open questions about the best way to even represent language and how to yeah. architectures that work with it. Yeah, yeah no, no, it, it is really tough. I think NLP is, you know, just one of those things where it's a class of problems that human, the human mind has been evolved over millions of years to be able to handle very efficiently, but yes. that we are still slightly stumped by. And the current yeah. best kind of class of techniques is probably deep learning, right? Yeah. Uh, and that is just a, you know, it's this idea that we're going to build these neural networks that are maybe inspired by the human brain and work in ways that are analogous to the way the human brain works. Yeah, uh, and we're going to build really deep neural networks, meaning they're going to be very big, lo have lots and lots of layers. Yeah, but uh, that also means the training time of these things are kind of ridiculous. Uh, yeah, and maybe you know, for the first time since like the IBM 360 or maybe the Windows computer, suddenly mm -hmm. there's this whole class of computing problems that mm -hmm. uh, a garage enthusiast uh, doesn't. It's just, it's let's say slightly outside the budget of a garage enthusiast, right? Like yeah. you could build lots of little websites and almost any current common web service these days. Uh -huh. you build a modern, tiny version of it on your own computer and for Twitter bucks, rent some Amazon servers and you know get a small version of Facebook or Twitter going. But you can't get a small version of a machine learning translation that's in any way decent going. And it's sort of, uh, I think mean, it leads to some interesting questions about sort of what's the direction of computer science or, yeah. uh, and, and technology, right, infotech. If suddenly yeah. there's these huge barriers to entry that's uh, beyond what we're used to, which is like you know a few months of your time, yeah. Uh, so I think that's a really, but yeah, so I, I think it's a really interesting question, a really deep question. Uh, I'd also uh, so another question people have, um, yeah. you know, you do a lot of uh, machine learning in, uh, at Google. What are some of your? What do you think are the easiest uh, tools to learn? PyTorch, TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, what would you say? Um, that's a good question. I, I think that the easiest ones, and, and again, I, I do want to um, kind of re reiterate something I mentioned at the beginning, which is just that anything I've talked about here is based on my own personal views and not necessarily reflective of Google. Um, I, among the options, among the things listed, um, I, I think that Scikit-Learn is um is probably easier, for example, than TensorFlow or PyTorch, and I say that because um Scikit-Learn is it's it's designed in part for a different class of of problems. It's designed for performing statistical analyses and things like that, and I think it's just easier to wrap your head around it because a lot of it follows traditional ways you you think about like software libraries. And um, for example, if you want to create a um a classifier or a regression, then you might use something from um, Scikit-Learn to um, to like, there's just a few lines. You you copy and paste the example, and you run it in um, either on the command line in like a, a Python environment, or you um, you put it into a um, an IPython notebook, and it just it just kind of works. Whereas um, TensorFlow, I, I've used TensorFlow more than um, PyTorch, and I found I am a little bit biased just because I started using TensorFlow a little bit more, and I've I haven't really developed anything new in PyTorch. So, um, but I have run programs that other people have developed in PyTorch. Um, I personally think TensorFlow is is fine. I, I, I um, I'm a something of a user of it, um, and I, I think that it because I, I, to me, it just kind of seemed to click a little bit more than PyTorch. But I, I, I'll be honest, I didn't really spend enough time working with PyTorch to feel like I, I can give it a like I gave it a fair shot to to really compare it and say it's either better or worse than TensorFlow. Got it. But it sounds like the easiest thing to learn is probably Scikit-Learn. Yeah, uh, I yeah I would start with Scikit-Learn certainly because it's like if you if you don't know that then like that's going to help you to debug things in your machine learning model anyways. So you might as well learn that. And and it, it's weird to say learn um, Scikit-Learn. Like I, I, to be honest, when I use like Scikit-Learn, I just kind of I know what I want, what sort of software library I want to use, but I don't know the name of it. So I like do a search on your favorite search engine for it, and um, and find something which is usually like I, I usually search for like I don't know, um, say regression tree um, space NumPy or SciPy or whatever, and then the right library sh um, shows up, and then 
I, I just click on it, look at some examples, look at the documentation, and then use it. So it's a little bit weird to say that you like learn um, something like scikit-learn, for example. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, and I think that also, you know, one of the reasons our machine learning courses use scikit-learn, at least at kind of the introductory level, as opposed to the more advanced levels, yeah. uh, is just because like the math and the modeling aspects of it are easier to understand than the you know, this complex compute graph and tensor yep. calculus, which is maybe a little harder for people uh, yeah. to grasp. Yeah. Uh, so I think, you know, not only is it maybe an easier to get started from a coding perspective, but it's also so easier to get started well from a mathematical perspective. Yeah, I also, um, that's a good point, point that you bring up and it's worth, I think, emphasizing this, um, the the challenge that you might face with something like TensorFlow because like you do have this compute graph and it's it's a little bit weird I think for people who aren't who don't have a computer science background to try to reason about a program where you like you create something which has a, a sequence of of steps and you run it and yet that thing doesn't run and it's it's frustrating I think for non computer scientists to um, and even some computer scientists too um, to, until you've seen it before um, it's frustrating to have that happen because you um, it's not what you expect if you're like starting out with this area. Um, it's only after kind of hitting your head against the wall a few times that you actually start to like um, appreciate that your this graph isn't executing until you actually hit session dot run or whatever on it, for example. Yeah, the uh, the, uh, the abstract compute graph is all the rate. So uh, anyway, so uh, thank you so much on taking the time out. And I really also want to thank well, I want to thank you and the audience uh, for coming and listening to us. I really hope you enjoyed this session of Data Science in 30 Minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you'd like to learn more, uh, I'd suggest you buy Sean's book, which is available in all the usual places. <laughs> yeah, it's on um, Amazon. You can get it um, in a Kindle version or a um, hard copy version. Uh, I recommend the hard copy version just because I, I don't know that the, all of the graphics in the Kindle version um, have um, were like I think it's hard to, to see some of them, so I'd recommend just going with the hard copy. Got it, got it. Uh, and I hope yes, yeah, so I hope everyone enjoyed it. If you want to learn more about the Data Incubator, you can go to our website, thedataincubator.com, where you can learn more about our free Data Science Fellowship for PhDs and Masters uh, or people with PhDs and Masters. To Degrees on versus for working professionals as well as our corporate training. All right, thank you everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Michael.